everybody, we're thrilled. We are still here and firing it all up. Thank you all for joining us here today. Irene Hausinger is joining me here today. You know, we get to, we've been just having a blast here talking to people and, you know, talking about some of the things that you've been able to express into the world. Now, you're also a student yes. as well. And I want to talk to you about that first, if I could, sure. then we'll talk about the workshop. And the reason I want to talk to you about that is because you know, there's something that calls us for it. Uh, you're in a doctoral program now, right? What was it that wanted you to study and become someone that is now going to be a PhD and a doctor? Because you're studying in a very hmm, unique transformative program, if yes. I might say. Yes. Tell us about it. Well, I'm very against standardized testing and I've accessed my different intelligences throughout throughout my life, and I just it didn't work for me. Yeah. So I, it took me about five years to find a doctoral program that was aligned with my philosophy, and I found the California Institute of Integral Studies. They're in California, and they're based off of the principles of integral yoga that were founded um, out of the Eastland Institute in the '60s, and they were actually the first institute in America that had an Asian studies department. Yeah, and they believe in creative reproduction instead of cyclical or reproductive education. So they do not have any GREs or anything like that, and you have to be a very skilled writer in order to enter the program. They're also one of the schools that gives funding to people that have spent time in the prison system. A lot of uh, federal inmates ha are denied um, federal loans and things for education, and so I really believe that they walk the talk, and they speak the talk, and they walk that talk as well. And I was so interested by their consciousness study department and this transformative studies and what exactly that, that meant, because we're always transforming throughout our lives. Yeah. And I couldn't see myself in a place that wanted my test scores and didn't see me as, as a whole person. Yeah. And so that's where that uh, was birthed. Um, a long time ago, I read an article about an organization that taught yoga in prison. And I said, if I ever moved to Seattle, I would absolutely pursue that. And I forgot about it for years. And then I moved here, and I rediscovered that, and I wow. said that would be an amazing thing to do a doctoral study on. Well, you know, part of this is really looking at parts of ourselves that we find is settling. You know, we're settling for something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, I could go get that job, or I could do this, or I could do that. And then we think, and, you know, then what happens is our heart kind of shuts down, and we're settling for a life that we're not really called to live. Mm -hmm. And it gets uncomfortable. You know, for you, what is it about this program, about what you're looking at for your future that is so calling you forward? What do you what do you wanna what do you wanna become here? Everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everything. Me uh, too. I just I don't like that all or nothing, you're in a, the same job for thirty years mm -hmm. or something. I find that very constraining and mm -hmm. so with my PhD, I would love to be able to write books and speak and lecture, and I'm also a musician, and so I wanted to do something. My ideal dream is to be a rock star and a PhD because it's perfect. You can travel and you can write and lecture and teach and, and do all of that and still have that music. And it's actually pretty common. Um, the lead singer of Bad Religion is a PhD um, in California. A yes. lot of different musicians have that paradigm, that shift between the academic and and, that, and I think that those things are very complementary to each other, and they both make my heart sing. I couldn't just be a musician or just be a PhD. But it was That's explained to me. Yeah, it was yeah. explained to me that a PhD is your union card. And once you get your union card, all of these doors are open. And so I'm struggling with actually the procrastination piece of finishing my dissertation and, and being disciplined. But I'm just looking towards the horizon of what does it mean yeah. to be a PhD and how I can influence change. Um, I was told once that people that have a bachelor's degree uh, consume knowledge. And then people that have a master's degree are savvy consumers. But then when you have a PhD, you create that knowledge. Yeah. And that was just so inspiring to me. Yeah, you know, that is really well said. And you know what I love about this and chatting with you is I started out wanting to be a rock star. I never thought I could ever accomplish a PhD or anything else uh, because of those exact restrictions you talk about. I mean, imagine sitting there for eight hours and taking a standardized test for something, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how the people of today do it. Uh, but, you know, taking that next step for me was about the creativeness mm. that I knew I had. 
The rock star thing, definitely I can't sing, so that did not work out. <laughs> but there's a part of what you're talking about in the integration of it all. And we just interviewed somebody, you know, Kat was just here, and we were talking about the fact that the world now is looking for a different model mm. for change, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how many people do you know that read books on transformation that actually change? It's got to be put into practice. Don't it's you think? It's an experiential right. embodied practice. And what about yoga? I mean, what if you were Dr. Rock Yoga? <laughs> yoga, right? right? I mean, think about it. Think about what could be created from, in, from looking at and blending and integrating the wisdom from different places. That's what I hear you saying for yourself. Absolutely, and that was actually the basis for my workshop this morning, yeah. was creating um, embodiment through yoga, through the goddess postures, which I noticed when I was taking this woman's spirituality class at the university, and I really struggled with this class. I, I loathed it until I didn't <laughs> loathe it. It was very difficult for me, um, just based on things that were happening in my life at the yeah. time. And we started to look at historical aspects of the goddess in terms of art. And I was looking at these images and I said, oh my goodness, these are yoga poses. And the books, wow. yeah, it was amazing. The books that we were reading had all these meditations. So be the goddess experience. And I'm like, this is yoga. So how do I take that aspect and work with the chakras and integrate the Jungian archetypes, which are all the same, different models, but the same thing. And so that's exactly what our workshop was on this morning, and taking all of those wow. things and actually being those. In yoga, people will look up postures to prescribe for themselves. So if you have hips, do this posture. If you have that, but it goes so much more beyond that. If you need to build confidence, you can do a warrior posture. If you need to wow. be grounded, you can be a mountain pose. And those are directly correlated to the goddess imagery. So one thing about passion, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so much of you know what I sense from you is being able to create something, first off, that isn't really in existence right now, and to reach out to people so that they can be fully expressed. How does what you do and what you see yourself doing help women become fully expressed? I would like to channel that into the work that I do at the prison. Sure. Um, the, oh. It's so wonderful. Yeah. I work with an agency called Yoga Behind Bars, and they provide yoga classes for men, women, and children in the juvenile and yeah. criminal justice system in Western Washington. And there are lots of different programs throughout the country. But what I noticed is that, you know, as, as women, we have all these different roles, and that's embodied with the goddess, the creator, the destroyer. And when yeah. you're in prison, you're just the destroyer. And so it doesn't matter if you have kids. It doesn't matter if you have all those other things. You're just seen as your crime, and that's terrible to me. And so there are a lot of different agencies that are going in and empowering women and empowering the people that are in there. Yeah. And it's amazing because yoga soothes from the inside out. About 80% of the women at the uh, WCCW the Corrections Center for Women yeah. have uh, drug and alcohol problems, about yeah. 80%. That's right. And so addiction's all about what can I get, what can I get to bring in, and yoga is, I'm gonna center myself and soothe from the inside out. And so the inspiration for my dissertation was yoga as a transformative catalyst of change in the lives of female inmates. So I'm doing a longitudinal study, and we're looking at tracking um, the ladies that come to our class and see how their perceptions change or what happens um, the longer they come to yoga. We know that recidivism rates can be drastically reduced. Yes. And it's used four classes. So if you have four yoga classes in a study by Gross and Loundell that was done at North yeah. Carolina, they found that your recidivism rate can be reduced by 25%. That's a big amount. It's huge. That's a big amount. What a great study. What a great, I mean, so how close are you to finishing? <laughs> um, we started our research in December. Yeah. So it'll be, Is it uh, going to be about a year? Yep. Good. And then uh, right now I'm just working on, on the outline. And it's great, great because it's collaborative between the ladies that are there, Yoga Behind Bars, and the Department of Corrections has been, has been great, too. It took me about a year and a half to two years to get permission to actually do the study. So it's been a great learning experience. What motivated you to do that? You know, what motivated you? I mean, I so appreciate that you are doing it. Um, but at the same time, you know, most of us that have been through the doctoral program, we understand what it takes to get pro. Well, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you don't understand, but let me just tell you <laughs> what it takes to get a, a research project approved anywhere. Oh, years. Yeah. 
there's the HRRC, there's the IRB, right. there's all these, and a lot of the institutions don't communicate with each other. Right. Um, and so that's, it's huge. But I was raised Congratulations. By, oh, thank you. I'm, I kind of feel like I'm a researcher now. I didn't until I got permission, yeah. so. Um, my father was a police officer, and uh -huh. so I was raised with this idea of crime and punishment, but it was very black and white, mm -hmm. um, as is what happens when you are a, a police officer, and that's fine, but I. I thought that there was a piece that was missing, a holistic piece. Yeah. Um, kind of a funny note, my father's now an en energy healer. Um, so he's come full circle with that. But I just noticed that there were, there were a lot of male prison studies and not a lot of female prison right. studies. And it's missing that sacred feminine. It's missing that. And 60, oh, let's see, I want to say 60 to 80% of the women that are incarcerated have families. 80% of those ladies that leave are going to be the caretakers of their families. So there are programs like the Milk Program and Girl Scouts Beyond Bars and okay. different things to help. Uh, there's a really cool program where you can read a book to your child on tape and then it's sent to the child with a storybook so That's their great. incarcerated parent gets to read them a bedtime story at night. So we're coming around to that but the literature and the, you know, we have the, the grassroots organizations and the yoga service organizations, and we're kind of combining them. And yoga, yoga academic research is an entirely new field, and they need to develop their language, and we yeah. are developing our language, but we have yoga researchers that are in oncology, and then we have social workers exactly. and anthropologists. Right. But there's no common language yet. Right. So I went to a yoga conference, and they were using the word, let's do a yoga intervention. And me being a social worker, I'm like, you can't use the word intervention when you're dealing with prison population right. or substance abuse because they're going to run away. They will. Right. Totally, right. So the field of yoga research is coming together. And then there's the field of yoga service. And that's things like yoga behind bars, uh, Phoenix Prison Trust, all these different things. So yes. it's emerging and we're here to stay. Well, I want to ask you this question. It's probably one of the few that I'll have to, to chat with you about during this conversation. Sure. Um, you know, many people have asked me about how, what I thought about, you know, knowing my history and, you know, where I've been in my life, my childhood. And they asked me what I thought about Orange is the New Black. Mm. <laughs> yes. And, you know, here we are with an insider's look, maybe, of women in prison. And it's become a, quote, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. The Golden Globe Awards, or whatever the last award show, the cast, the actors, all got awards. Mm -hmm. Are we on the right track with that? That's really interesting. It is. Um, there's <laughs> a huge difference between federal prisons and state prisons. Yeah, there is. We should make that distinction. Yes. Right, And right, so right. Orange is the New Black is a federal prison. Federal prison. And then right. there's the country club prisons for white collar crimes where there's Well, we have what's her face in the country club now. What's her face? The, the housewife of whatever she is that got caught. She's oh, in Teresa? the country. She's in the country club. Right. Because she's like. Yeah, that, from what I hear, right. Yes, Teresa. Yeah, yeah Teresa, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And then we had Martha Stewart. Um, so, and I, I hear, you know, the prisons are so different. Um, yeah. Jail, I've, I've heard of, this might sound counterintuitive, but a lot of people would prefer to go to prison than jail because yeah. um, there's more amenities yeah. at, at that level. Um, and I have several students that are spending time at the state prison and then they're going to go to the federal prison after they serve their time. Yeah. So the orange is the new black. The character study is incredible. Yes, um, that's what I thought too. Yeah. It is definitely, there's some glamour there, the, you know, the Hollywoodization. I don't right. know if that's the word. But, um, I think that it's great that there's the discussion there. And I think that having something like that is going to lead people to do more research, such as uh, there's a great book called The, the New Jim Crow, mm. and it came out in 2010, and then another version was released a couple years ago. Wow, and yeah. that talks about the racialized prison system. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because in Washington, at the women's prison, about 70% of the residents are actually uh, white. Yeah. And so we see you know, different cultures and, and things. Um, I, I, I'm a fan of the show. I binge watch it every July when it comes I'm out. I'm a binge watcher. And then you have to wait a whole year. Yeah, we have to wait. That's, I'm okay with that, though. I no, am, too. I'm okay with that. To be honest. You know, I, I am. <laughs> uh, because, you know, I, I'm kind of like still trying to wrap my mind around it conceptually and, you know, wondering 
you, you know, what about that is going to be the message that people see? Mm. You know, what is, what is the message that they're going to see? Uh, but what you're doing is so profoundly important. It really is. And I'm so thrilled that you've gotten approval for the study. I really am. Because, you know, as a former PhD student, I really do understand what you got to go through <laughs> to get even my little project. But what mm -hmm. you must have gone through, thank you for not giving up. Or thank you, better yet, to those of you that know, many of us cave in to lesser thesis projects. But you didn't. Thank you. I didn't, and I, I feel like it's definitely a labor of love, and it's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I knew that coming into the program that that's yeah. what I wanted to do. And a lot of my my cohort, they were figuring out what they wanted to do with their study. But from day one, I'm like, no, we're going to do prison, <laughs> we're going to do yoga. And so I think that my motivation and enthusiasm yeah. kind of blinded me to the reality of. We're four years in right now. I just started my research, and it's expensive, and it's time-consuming, and people don't understand, and yeah. people get tired of talking about it, and because uh, you're, you know, you're so specialized, yeah. and the people around you care a little bit, but you care more. Of yes, yeah. and they do get tired. <laughs> you know, do. I studied broken promises for eight years. Mm. Oh yeah. I needed to go to therapy after that dissertation, but you know, I, I need to commend you because part of what you're doing isn't for the degree. It is for your life's work. And that really is, I believe, why you know, you've been chosen to do this. It's, it's not about one group. It's going to be about the many mm -hmm. that are going to need what you're doing. Because we do not want to see women go back out on the street and, and have a hopeless, helpless life. So thank you for doing thank that. You. And thank you for joining me here Absolutely. Today. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to be following up with you, okay? Sounds good. Thank All you. All right. Thank you. We're going to take a short break.